This is a trip back to the beginning of our century, to the moment when history was first caught by the moving pictures. It's the story of early filmmaking and of the first movies and their audiences. But it's also about the figures in the shadows, writers, artists, and visionaries of all kinds who looked forward to the age of cinema and to the modern world that came with it. The first audiences found something unsettling about film. People on screen looked like ghosts. It was another world they were watching, a modern kind of magic. Right from the start, fantasy was a vital part of cinema. It dealt in illusions, dreams, miracles, unbelievable spectacles of all kinds. On the screen, anything could happen. Here, was a new art of the imagination. century was as much under the spell of the occult as anything else. Everyone, royalty, soldiers, scientists, priests, and ordinary people seem to be caught up in a collective will to believe. But believe what? That you could communicate with the dead, see into the future, conjure up spirits. The respectable Victorians threw themselves into spiritualism, seances, tarot cards, and magic of all kinds. And that's where the horror movies came in. 200 years ago, in Paris. They began with the Phantasmagoria, a gothic twist on the Magic Lantern show pioneered by Monsieur Etienne Robertson. Sir David Brewster, scientist, photographer, and lanternist, Describe this late night entertainment. Those who saw Monsieur Robertson's original Fantasmagorie in Paris, where it was shown in an old ruined monastery, confirm that it was a truly alarming spectacle, certainly not for those of a nervous disposition. They found themselves in total darkness amid thunder and lightning, with spectres, skeletons, and terrific figures advancing upon them. And how was this natural magic displayed? A thin, transparent sheet had, unknown to the spectators, been let down after the disappearance of the light. The ghostly apparitions were projected by a lantern mounted on rails, whilst others, such as the bats, were from a hand. Robertson used to include bloodthirsty scenes from the recent French Revolution in his Phantasmagoria show. 
And it was also the revolution that got Madame Tussauds started with her waxwork chamber of horrors. But as memories of the terror faded, a cult of the supernatural began to emerge. What you couldn't see turned out to be just as scary as a good disemboweling. This was the age of mediums and seances. And as well as talking to the other side, you could even imagine you were seeing it, thanks to the Victorian craze for spirit photography. By the end of the century, another kind of ghostly image had appeared. Rentgen's X-ray process could turn anyone into a ghost. The first glimpse inside the body was like a preview of life beyond the grave, a chance to stare death in the face. Although developed for medical purposes, they were quickly taken up as showbiz by the inventor Thomas Edison and others. X-ray demonstrations in theaters and fairgrounds drew huge crowds eager to try out for themselves this unnerving new marvel. X-ray shows were a bigger draw than the movies. So when X-ray films were made for scientific purposes, they found a popular audience as ghoulish entertainment. The movies quickly learned to indulge the audience's taste for the macabre. Skeletons had been the visible symbol of death for centuries. Thanks to x-rays and film, they got a new lease of life. Films like this were often bought by magicians to show as part of their act. Magic was one of the main ways in which the Victorians explored the occult. It was an entertainment, but one which brought dark forces into play. Performers like the Davenport brothers presented themselves as spiritualists, using mystical powers to conjure up all kinds of illusions. Audiences gradually grew wise to the tricks of the trade, and so different magic shows evolved. Masklin and Cook ran a program of illusion based around exposés of fake mystics. This was magic with the lights up.
As more and more tricks of the trade were exposed, film helped conjurers devise a different kind of magic. It offered a whole new bag of tricks. The famous film magician of all was George Méliès. Méliès was inspired to learn magic from seeing Masculine and Cook's act while he was in London. Returning to Paris, he bought the famous Robert Houdin Theatre of Illusion. He performed there as a conjurer where he got to hear about the cinematograph. He wanted one, but the Lumiere brothers wouldn't sell. So he made his own and started to include moving pictures in the theatre's program. Soon he left the theater behind to concentrate on the magic of film. He built a special effects studio, he used elaborate scenery, and created the basic vocabulary of special effects that are still in use today. Finding his film back in the camera and reshooting layer after layer of new images allowed him to create amazing scenes which I still find staggering. But Méliès wasn't just a special effects genius. He explored practically every genre, creating a world of miracles and nonsense.
actors he used were acrobats, girls and singers from the music hall. Proper theater actors refused, considering film to be beneath them, until they discovered that they could earn double the money. In just a few years, Meliers had built up an international distribution network with offices in half a dozen countries. His company, Star Films, set a new standard for film fantasy. But Melier's films were expensive to make, which meant he charged higher prices than other producers. Charles Pathé accused him of being that most despised creature to the businessmen of cinema, an artist. But Melier's was happy to be an artist, at least until his business collapsed in 1913. Fifteen years later, he was discovered in Montparnasse railway station, running a stall, selling children's toys. When his surviving films were shown again, filmmakers and audiences alike were dumbfounded. It's the work of the devil. Satan is trying to steal this new light of the world. I tell you, these moving pictures are going to be the best teachers and preachers in the history of the world. But only if we keep them pure. Mark my word, there are two things coming to God's own country. The prohibition of liquor and motion pictures. If evangelists like Colonel Henry Hadley had their way, the wizardry of Melies and his little devils would soon be replaced on screen by a more acceptable brand of magic. The Holy Miracle. The Life of Christ was the best known story in the Western world. Artists had been doing the publicity for over a thousand years. The movie had a lot of expectations to live up to. The commercial potential was enormous, but there were problems. Which version of the script to go with? Do the miracles make it a special effects blockbuster? Or is it a human interest picture? And the big question, how do you cast the lead? It raised the problem of blasphemy. Could the living Jesus be represented or was he beyond the power of the camera? The photographer F. Holland Day had already run into problems in the 1860s when he posed himself, after some pretty drastic dieting, for some tasteful crucifixion studies. All this challenged the filmmakers, pushing them to new heights of ambition Miracles and special effects had to appear suitably spectacular, and yet reverential. The need for authenticity introduced the idea of location filming for the first time. In 1912, the Kalem Company decamped to Palestine to make the spectacular From the Manger to the Cross.
It was also the first time that all the various scenes and episodes in the life of Christ had been drawn together. With a running time of over 80 minutes, it was the first American feature-length film. More impressive was the Italian epic Quo Vadis, which took the Christian story on to ancient Rome. This was the biggest film so far made, and it created a worldwide sensation. It inspired D.W. Griffith to think big, and King George V was so impressed that he wanted to meet the cast. Quo Vadis launched the whole notion of cinema as spectacle. But what lay behind all this spectacle? What was cinema's special poetry? This was how the Russian writer Maxim Gorky had described his first encounter. Yesterday I visited the kingdom of the shadows. If you could only imagine how strange it is there. There are no sounds, no colors, everything. Earth, trees, water, air, people, is tinted in tones of gray. In a gray sky there are gray rays of sunlight. In gray faces there are gray eyes, and the leaves of the trees are gray, like ashes. This isn't life. It's a shadow of life. It's not movement, but a silent ghost of movement. I must explain. In case I'm suspected of going mad or of uh, joining the symbolists, I saw the Lumiere cinematograph yesterday. What a talent the Russians have for exaggeration. Monsieur Gorky thinks he is mocking symbolism, but he manages to put his finger, if not his Cossack boot, on what it is that makes the cinematograph such a suggestive novelty. I think I was somewhat ahead of my time, as usual, with the picture of Dorian Gray. For what is it but a portrait in time? before the moving pictures. Young Darian's portrait, you may recall, grows old and ugly, while his own appearance remains innocent and youthful. No, I suggest the cinematograph could save us all the trouble of living our sordid, so-called real lives, when we could see far more attractive people living them on the screen for us. Like Oscar Wilde, others were fascinated by the idea that a moving image could have a life of its own. And this is actually the subject of an early British film. Incidentally, the lady who gets mad with her independent image here is thought to be the dancer Isadora Duncan. Although it could be played for laughs, there was something unsettling, even haunting, about the very idea of a film image. Rudyard Kipling was one of the first to explore this in his story, Mrs. Bathurst. Vickery was a stoker I met up with in Cape Town when we were both between ships. He seemed to be in a stew about something, but all he would say was, wait till you see her. Turned out he wanted me to go with him to one of those new kinematograph shows. This one was called Home and Friends for a Ticky. 
Sitting there under the tropical sky with flickering pictures of familiar scenes from England felt pretty strange. But nothing like as strange as Vickery's reaction to one of the pictures. This was the Plymouth Express arriving in Paddington Station. And as soon as it appeared, Vickery grabbed my arm and hissed, There she is. That's her. Shora's life, ain't it? Er uh, meant Mrs. Bathurst, who kept her boarding house in Auckland, New Zealand, much frequented by sailors. She must have meant a lot to Vickery, because he dragged me back to the kinematograph every night I was in Cape Town, and paid for us both to get blind drunk afterwards. All for that 45 seconds of Mrs. B, walking down towards us with a blindish look in her eyes. Oh, what's she doing in England, I said during one of our drinking sessions, <laughs> just to make conversation. It almost seemed like she's looking for somebody. Vickery suddenly stopped in his tracks and said very softly, She's looking for me. And that's all I ever got out of him. What happened to him, you're wondering? I only heard about it much later. Apparently, he headed off upcountry, and they found him dead at the end of the railway line, struck by lightning and black as charcoal. It was the kinematograph that did for him. Other writers like Virginia Woolf anticipated a new role for film in the future. I still remember how fascinating the first films were. They showed us life as it is, and we have no part in it. Simple things, but suddenly seen from this new angle. And then the films turned to literature, and it was a disaster. Everything that comes from inside a character became external, dreadful. But might there not be a secret language which we feel and see but never speak? Might filmmakers discover this and somehow create waking dreams, a new language of emotion? Sometimes in the chaos of a street one can glimpse a scene waiting for a new art form to capture it, but then it's gone. Surely in the future, films could do this. There were other contenders apart from films trying to capture the impossible. The city's unconscious was bursting out everywhere in comic strips, which were born at the same time as moving pictures in the 1890s. The cartoons of Windsor McKay are all about fantasy erupting out of the everyday. Dreams of the Rarebit Fiend and Little Nemo in Slumberland offer the most amazing portrayal of dream as fantasy. His strips are incredibly cinematic. They want to be movies. The images refuse to be contained on the page. When cinema did try and latch onto his vision and enter dreamland, the result was fun, but looked a little primitive by comparison.
The first wave of films used dreams as an excuse for showing audiences all the tricks of knockabout fantasy fun. But outside the picture house, dreams were increasingly taken seriously. Thanks to Sigmund Freud, dreams had meaning. Their language and symbolism was a rich new source of inspiration for artists of all kinds. The challenge was tailor-made for the cinema. Now audiences were ready for deeper characterization and psychological realism. As the vogue for trickery faded, cinema moved into a new domain. Dreams play an essential part in the Danish film Atlantis, the story of a man who travels around the world to escape the horror of his wife's mental breakdown. While crossing the Atlantic in a luxury liner, he dreams he's in the lost city of Atlantis. Suddenly, he's awakened to find the ship is sinking. Others gradually came forward to take on the unique challenge film offered. Paul Wegner was a well-known German stage actor who risked his reputation by going into the movies. In 1916, he gave a public lecture in Berlin entitled, The Artistic Possibilities of Film. I entered the cinema because I wanted to do what could only be done with film to create a split personality on screen, a doppelganger that would be the equal of anything imagined by Hoffmann. The result was my film, The Student of Prague, which you can judge for yourselves. It's a twist on the Faust story about a poor student who sells his reflection to a mysterious stranger and is then haunted by his double. It comes right out of the tradition of E.T.A. Hoffman, the creator of modern supernatural horror. One of Freud's colleagues, Otto Rank, used the film as his starting point for a study of the theme of the doppelganger, or double, in art and literature. future. I believe that the true poet of the cinema must be the camera. 
There must be constant changes of point of view for the spectator, tracking shots through split-screen images, mirrors, everything to take us into a new pictorial fantasy world and away from the idiotic society dramas which dominate our screens today. Wagner and others were starting to realize that potential in film that Virginia Woolf had glimpsed. They were tapping into the secret language of the unconscious. But while some were looking to a bright new future for film as art, moving pictures were becoming something else, something more. It was the movies. Everyone went, the famous, the infamous, and the anonymous. They soaked up the dreams they saw on screen, and then they took them back into the real world. As movies became more like real life, so real life came to resemble a movie. In the darkness of the cinema, we all found another life. It was the fantasy life of the 20th century.